All right, so I'm Sebastian, and I'm going to be talking about a little uh, thing called hmm? server push, HTTP2 server push. Anybody here used it? I'm like super excited about it, and I have been for many, many years. So that's the problem. Nobody's using it. <laughs> yes. Uh, so I've managed to you know, start using it, but it took me two years of building a CDN and a lot of other things along the way to get to this point. And now you're starting to find out that people are like, ah, should we still have it because there's not a lot of adoption and it's like a really hard thing to use. But there's good news. Actually, uh, any Node developers here? Node.js, Node.js, yes, yes, yes. Okay, so Node.js has just shipped with uh, a stable version of HTTP2 and it includes server push support. Um, it was sort of experimental for, for like half a year or something in like eight and nine. Pretty much stable API. It'll it'll probably go like LTS in a couple of months. Like it's targeted for October, but we'll see. Um, so you can play with this, but that still leaves like front end developers like myself at a sort of a struggle of how do you use this to bundle my apps or what do I do with this on the front end side? Because I'm not using Node on the front end side. I'm just writing code that runs in a browser. So what, what's this Node stuff about? Um, and I'll show you how I think we can use this. So the main problem of front end developer performance is that resources just take forever to load. Like you've got a lot of resources and they keep getting bigger and bigger and there's more and more files and that's just gonna continue happening. And when you're in the real world, you have a thing called round trip time, RTT. I'll just abbreviate it in the rest of the slides. So round trip time is solved fundamentally by CDNs, right? That's just the brute force. You put your server everywhere in the world close to everybody in the world and it's fantastic. It just magically solves it where that magic is an extremely expensive multi-billion dollar operation. Okay, cool. So it happens that that's pretty much free now for everyone, thanks to companies like Cloudflare and everyone else. Um, but you know, maybe there's other ways to solve that as well, like using software and algorithms. So in a traditional website, you know, you've got like your product page and it loads like a product image, and you know, you've got to throw your styles and your JavaScript, and obviously a fav icon. Fav icon. Still don't know how to pronounce that. It's been like 20 years. Um, so. What happens is the browser does something like this. It's like this long, arduous journey. Um, so I've sort of symbolized like a round trip, like, no, sorry, a trip as a single, uh, what, what's this called again in English? Hourglass. Hourglass, nice. Well, that's great. <laughs> yeah, so, so pretend it takes an hour to reach your server because you don't have a CDN. Um, and you live on like, what is that, Mars then? That's 45 minutes? So, so your round trip time, you're doing like one, two, three, four, you know, boing, 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 boing. Um, at the network level, something like this happens. I know like the class prep uh, have like this awesome uh, TLS 1.3, which might reduce this a little bit. And caveat, the round trip time for DNS might be totally different than the one to your web server because it's doing like a totally separate lookup unless you happen to be using a, let's say a CDN that has DNS, uh, but still. So you're doing a bunch of round trips. Uh, to initially set up your connection to the web server. And then your browser goes, get this product page for me, okay? So it has to send that, hence another round trip, or like another trip. Um, the browser, no, sorry, the server then returns headers and can start pushing data. Okay, so now, you've, now the browser has received the data for the entire HTML page. Then it figures out in that HTML, there's a reference to photos, there's a reference to styles, there's a reference to apps, uh, you know, CSS, JavaScript, and other kinds of stuff. And each time it has to like make another request, so again it has to wait for that response. And in the traditional sense, it'll start setting up all these parallel connections, which is this weird hack to sort of get around the head of line blocking, um, which is like, you know, you want to send a request, but you want to actually send like 10 requests. So you, the browser sets up like a reasonable amount of connections, which is sort of six or eight or whatever. Uh, it's really expensive because each time it sets up a new connection, it has to do at least part of that setup, the original setup, at least part of that has to be re repeated. Uh, the server has to maintain more connections, so it's really expensive in terms of memory and CPU on the server side, on the client side, your battery drains, everybody's unhappy. I mean, I am unhappy as a web developer. So my solution is server push. The server could just tell the client, this is all the stuff you need, go away. That works something like this. HTTP2 has a thing called push promise, which is like, like a response, but more like a request actually, because the server sort of sends this thing, saying like, hey, you're gonna request this thing, trust me. I promise you. So it pushes a promise for a future request. So the first time you set up a connection, just like the olden days, uh, you get your product page, 
And then the server just says like, oh, before you get this product thing, I'm just going to tell you that you'll also want this, 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 and this. And then it's going to return the product page. And then the client starts parsing this, and it's like happy, happy. And meanwhile, the browser just continues pushing this data, pushes the headers to the response to the request that was promised by the push. Right? Get it? Yeah. So the server just keeps pushing all this data until the very end. And there is never a you know additional round trip, which is the optimal case. All round trip times eliminated. Who needs a CDN anymore, right? <laughs> I mean, this thing still could use a CDN, so whatever. It's just still some need. But you know, it's largely gone, which is cool. And this is just using. Um, actually, this is the point where I'm sh I should mention like some algorithm that has some name and it's some computer sciencey thing, but I don't care. Um, what happens is that if you have low latency, you can ramp up the speed at which you push all this data. Whereas if you have long latency, like, lo like really long delays, each time you sort of, your browser sends a bunch of data, it'll sort of back off and go like, okay, 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 have you received it? Are you okay, buddy? Right? It'll go like, are you okay, browser? Is this too much? Or actually, it's like waiting for the entire network to catch up and acknowledge that all the data has been delivered before it starts pushing more data. Otherwise, packets just get dropped. It's sending too much. At some point, somebody has to give, and it'll just drop packets. And then you'll never know that you have to extend them again. It'll take a long time. So if you have low latency, you still get some benefit from like ramping up faster. But eventually, you get sort of a, a, a high bandwidth on the single connection. And the idea with HTTP2 is actually you maintain that single connection for as long as you can. Because you only have one, so it's much cheaper than maintaining like six connections. Right, where you're trying to like cut those connections back to free resources on the server. Right, with HTTP2, you're trying to maintain that connection for as long as you can. And in fact, with HTTP2, there's cool stuff. You can send like different domains on the same connection and all that stuff. So, so there's 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 still a lot of benefit to only doing this once, even if it's expensive. You just do this once, and then everything else you just push and you eliminate all the round trips. So, how do I want to do this? Well, I have a thing called push manifest. So this is not like an official thing. This is just like a SEB thing. This is something I came up with randomly. But it works pretty well. So this is what it looks like. It's really simple. But I think it works pretty well. Uh, so here, this is like a HTTP method. So if you get index HTML, you push app.js. If you get app.js, you push lib.js, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you could expand on this and say, if you get index.html, make this an array and say, oh, you know, also push my favicon or push my style CSS or whatever, right? So you can expand on that and you can see it's recursive. So, it, it, you know, whatever engine parses this would figure out that when I'm getting index.html, I should push app.js as well as lib.js, obviously, because it's going to be the next logical thing. So the goal is something that, you know, sort of a Perl thing, make easy things easy and hard things possible. Uh, I do that by making, making the whole thing based on JSON, which everything knows how to use. Uh, make it declarative, so it's not like running code. It's just saying what should happen. And it is neutral for any tools or servers to implement this. And I've sort of put this up on GitLab because I'm a hipster, and I was using GitLab two years ago before Microsoft acquired GitHub. <laughs> so this is GitLab. For those not yet familiar, you will soon find out. So, I will do a little demo of this. I just didn't prepare a little more slides than that. Now, mostly the same thing. So it's really simple. You can you can use like wildcards and just go like, oh, just push all my C JS and CSS. This is like the ultimate foot gun, by the way, for performance. Like if you have like your node modules folder on your thing, you can imagine the horrors that await the browser when it receives like ten thousand JS files. Glorious. So yeah, there's a bunch of stuff here, but like so you can, you can do things like you can you can put URLs in there. You can put like you can capture things from the original request URL and then sort of like so this is this is sort of where it gets the declarativeness, right? So you can you can sort of take parts of the URL and then have a simple rule that handles infinite complexity. Um, so they can be nested. You can imagine that you you probably might not even want to do all this tricky wildcards and pattern matching stuff. You might just want to just generate this with a tool. I don't have such a tool, but I would be very interested in working on it um, when I get around to it. You know, There's other stuff. You can sort of make it more verbose. You can assign priorities, which is going to maybe tell the server which order to send these things in. So maybe like send the CSS files before you send the giant video file. right? 
So, et cetera, et cetera. So you, you can imagine what this does, I hope. And to sort of demonstrate it a little bit further, let me show you a little demo. So here's, actually, here's the website that I've been working on for my little CDN thing. So the content is a little outdated, but the technology is cool. So what it does is it's got a little login page, and it loads pretty quick, you see? So this actually loads from any number of servers. I don't even know which, last month I was saying this comes from a server in my house. Now I don't know anymore because it's coming from my CDN with multiple pops. So that's pretty cool. But it still loads pretty fast, right? And the reason for that is that it's all being pushed. So there's only a single request happening. How do I prove that? Well, I can clone the repository and run it locally. And you'll see that if I run server, like if I run deploy, it'll upload it to my CDN. And if I just run a server, is it like a local copy of the CDN that just runs locally? It's like having GitHub pages or Netlify locally on your computer. And it's just a static site. And it looks something like this. So I have my little manifest here. So this other stuff is like a server configuration thing, but the manifest part is this array. Then when it's highlighted, can you sort of make out that contrast on the projector that's being front lit by a lamp? No. Anyway, so this manifest thing here, it's got two rules. One is an index HTML and one is uh, app HTML. The two entry points, because there's like a static home page and then there's like a dashboard. And so the login page and everything below it is gonna be app HTML, it's like a single page app. And your index HTML is just a very simple like one page, you know, this is the, this is the project kind of thing. So there's no JavaScript on the home page, but there's a lot of JavaScript on the dashboard. And for instance, if we look at app HTML, like that's all it is. Okay, so it loads app.js, app.css, favicon, then app.js itself, this is not transpiled, right? This is just a bunch of static imports, and that works in like every browser I care about. So you've got your you know, components, and they've all got JavaScript files, and then they will call other JavaScript files, et cetera, all the way down. And the way that the manifest does that is it just has a couple of push rules. Has three rules here, so it'll push styles, anything in the app, fonts, and configuration, CSS file names, okay, and then it'll push all files, like star, star, slash, star, is like a, like a wildcard, like crazy glob, like just everything from the fonts, images, and scripts directories, and then it just makes sure that it doesn't push any source maps, because that just like takes up bandwidth that you don't need in production, right, but I like to have them for development, so when I open up the dev tools, it'll load them, you know, independently. I don't care about performance at that point. And if I run this locally, so npm run server, okay. So this is spinning up like Node.js and a static site server, like you're all familiar with the various static site servers. Um, so this one spins up this public directory with my assets that we just walked through on like a local host. I'm not left-handed, I can't do this. Okay, and when we open this, page loads, okay, so we got everything here, loaded pretty instantly, because it's a really simple page. And here, well, it's easier to look at it as like a blob of text like that. So what happened is that we got one request, our get slash, like this is the homepage, right? And then everything else was just pushed, simply pushed. And the server just sort of managed to not make a single additional request because that's, remember that sequence that I said? Like first it'll just request and then before it returns the HTML, it'll just send all these push promises. So be, then it returns the body to the request. But well, while the browser is parsing that, it already knows not to request all these other things because it's expecting them to be sent automatically. And meanwhile the server is just pushing all that stuff automatically behind the scenes. So it's sort of maximizing, you know, all your CPU cores and your bandwidth and all that cool stuff. And this is like super optimized without doing anything. There's no transpilation required. There's no crazy configurations. It's just like a wild card in a, in, a, in a manifest, right? So that's pretty sweet. Um, what happens if we click on like that inner page, right? We had like, this is your index HTML. What about that app HTML? That was a little bit more complex. So when we load that, all right, poof, instantly loads. And there's like a little bit more going on here. There's a lot of JavaScript files here. So let's zoom out further, cameraman. And there's a lot more files being sent. That was the previous stuff that was being sent, the one that the block that's highlighted. And then here we've got this inner page, this sign up link that I clicked on. Right? So we've got a single request. 
and then everything else is just push, 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 push. So everything is push. So not a single round trip. Goodbye, CDNs. Goodbye. So yeah, it works. You can use Server 2, HTTP 2 Server Push now. Works pretty well. So I mean, there's a bunch of questions around this. Like, what if you refresh the page? It's going to push all that stuff again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's other things. I'll do another talk about that once I implement a couple more tweaks. Um, this is potentially much easier and much better performant than anything people do today with Webpack or Browserify or whatever you want to use, Broccoli or something. Um, yeah, so this works. I don't know. This was sort of my presentation. I don't really have a ending punchline thing, you know. Mm. Okay, cool. Thank you. Any no. any questions at all or anything? Is yeah. Node.js the only option for doing server push? Oh, so actually, you know, one of the things that I think are important is that this format itself is not really like an RFC, but it's still just a simple spec. It's not something that's proprietary. It is is nothing tying it to the implementation that I did. Mine is just one implementation thereof. So you could imagine something like, so for instance, um, the workers that we talked about, the Cloudflare web, web workers, like the, the edge servers worker type of cool stuff, uh, or, or if you think of like, like Fastly, another CDN that has this varnish configuration language thing. So in, in either of those cases, they, I, I, does Cloudflare support server push? Anyone? No? Yeah? 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 Cool. Cool. So, so when you have a CDN that supports server push, it's still really hard to configure that because they use some, you know, some 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 API. And you have to learn that. So it'd be nice if there was a tool where you could sort of write your rules in a simple JSON declarative thing, and then just generates the code that you push or, or wherever or to your you know object storage bucket, let's say, um, to any of these things that that that, sub, that actually host at the end, you know, at the at the at the, at the edge, right? So it would be cool if you could have these rules in a neutral thing, and then have sort of translators. That's what I feel would be cool. So you, you it, actually, I, I, maybe I should spend a couple of days doing that, like just for different platforms, just implement different translators. Because right now it's like, yeah, my platform is the only one that supports it because I, yeah, and it looks kind of like stupid. So I, I think it would be a cool, like, I because I, mean, I still don't know what the point of all the service workers at the edge thing is. Everyone supports it now, and it's really like cool techno technologically. But I don't see the killer app, and I think this could be something really, you know, practical and valuable, and and relatively easy to do. Because um, you could generate the manifest from like a Webpack kind of tool that's already parsing your code. Like a plugin could, you know, like you have these analysis plugins, and you have plugins that do like like a like a like what's that old browser manifest cache thing? What's it called, Indian? No, 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 no. So like, there's like some cache manifest thing in the browser, right? Cache manifest is that the name? App cache. Thank you, thank you. Yes. Um, so, so you have these tools that already generate stuff like that, and then you could just generate something like this, and then have this then translate into like any edge platform, for instance. And it would be like nice decoupling of all of everyone else's implementations. So that's sort of what I hope to achieve with this, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Any any other question? Yeah. Oh yeah, Ben. Yeah. Do you have a sample project set up that has this app manifest running, and then spit up the server? And you can just kind of see it working from an end-to-end -end perspective. Um, yeah, so I sort of been using it on a couple of different sites. I think last year I tried it on the JSCon of Asia website also. That might, I'm not sure that's still running on that, uh, but in the repository you might find it. You might still find like a configuration file. Uh, but actually, like, so the one I just showed is, is, a, is, you know, like everything on the project is open source. So you could find this at comments host slash website. I mean, check out the manifest uh, thing. Oh, there might be links to it there. Uh, or maybe not, okay. So check out website. So get gitlab.com slash comments host slash website. And that loads in a bit. You'll find like a config file here. That's just like a sample. This is just a very, very simple. So there's, there's like one folder with the source code in it and it's not really transpiled. It's just being copied into a public folder. And then all, all you find here is a manifest that contains these simple rules. And so you can just play with that, tweak it a bit, see what works, see what doesn't. Um, yeah, take a look. Let me know, let me know, please. Okay, any more questions? 
Okay, we're going to wrap it up. Oh, uh, Joey, yes? I, I, I thought I heard that you were paying people to host service in their homes. Was that my imagination? Partially. <laughs> I, made, I convinced them to pay me. No, I, I don't, no, 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 nothing of this is true. Um, to clarify, so last month I had these servers and I was like telling people I'm, I'm really poor, I can't afford this anymore. I only had one. And then a bunch of people stepped forward and graciously funded, you know, the acquisition of, some, you know, further hardware of which I have a few here to deliver to some of the generous donors in the audience. And uh, a few of them have already been shipped out and I've spent a lot of time just like sort of automating the configuration and, uh, you know, I remapped the DNS stuff a bunch of times. I went over to KL to set it up manually and, you know, I've had a pretty cool doing all this. But I don't pay anyone to do anything. Like, I, I can't. Uh, yeah, so my service is built on a web server that implements this. So, but the service is really just like a, like a static site hosting thing that just happens to use the static site service that I wrote, which supports the spec that I did on HTTP2 that I implemented last year. And it just goes all the way down. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's, that's it. Any, any more pressing point? Maybe we have time for one more or not. No, we have no more time. Everybody wants to go home. Cool. All right, thank you again.